gospel accounts, many of the uh, conversations between Jesus and the leadership among the Jews in the first century, we get a very good idea of their attitudes, their personalities. One such conversation we find in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Of course, we can see in the context that Jesus was discussing bondage to sin, bondage to Satan. But we also see in the answer or the response uh, an, an arrogance. An arrogance uh, which many of the uh, Jewish leadership had. An arrogance which caused them to reject Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords. An arrogance, therefore, which caused spiritual problems, but also an arrogance which caused secular problems. During the first century, there were uh, factions, as has already been pointed out in previous lessons today. There were factions uh, among the Jewish leadership. Two of the main ones were the Zealots, who were a uh, radical nationalist. They were intent on war with Rome because somewhat similar to the uh, attitude that was stressed here in this passage. They did not like the idea of being in bondage to any man. And uh, so, as we mentioned, they, uh, they were intent on rebelling and revolting against Roman rule. Then there was the Sanhedrin, a religious court of uh, elder priests, and although there was uh, division among them, the majority of its members desired peace. The Sanhedrin became the government, the rebel government, because of its uh, leadership, its organization, but it never exerted control over the zealots. Uh, because, again, of their uh, rebellion against government. In an attempt to influence and moderate the zealots' power, to keep from there being a war with Rome, the Sanhedrin appointed five regional governors. We're going to mention particular in uh, particular one of those uh, for purposes of our study this evening, Joseph ben Matthias, who is referred to by many as Josephus, and we'll see later on in the lesson uh, where he received the name Josephus, but he was a learned Jewish priest who shared uh, the high priest's dislike of rebellion. He received the governorship of Galilee. And it was his responsibility to unite the rebel groups in Galilee to stop their raids against the Romans to keep from provoking war in hope of eventually securing a negotiated peace with Rome. The Sanhedrin was overthrown by the zealots in Jerusalem and Ananus, who was the high priest, was executed. The zealots began pressuring Josephus to prosecute a more vigorous revolt 
against Rome because, again, they were set on war. At the same time, there were other, uh, other men who desired the leadership that Josephus had. Uh, one of them was John of Giscala, and he concocted moves to try to remove Josephus from power, even trying to, uh, trying to uh, kill Josephus. And even though Josephus was pushing for peace, nevertheless, the revolt against Rome went too far. Went far enough that he was no longer able really to push peace. And thus, he became uh, one, of the, one of the leaders of uh, the armies of the Jews, particularly in... Uh, some of the fighting that we will that we will mention just a moment in our lesson. But understand also that Josephus, his background uh, being uh, a priest, uh, he also believed himself to uh, have received revelations from God on various occasions, and he also decided that one of the revelations that he received from God through a dream was in fact that he was directed by God to lead in a fight against the Roman army. By the start of Vespasian's campaign, the emperor of Rome, Josephus had amassed a professional army of 250 horse soldiers, 4,500 infantrymen, and an elite personal guard of 600 men plus another 30,000 men who were uh, mostly draftees uh, that Josephus felt were unreliable to say the least. Josephus uh, also in fact being having a good military mind he fortified many of the towns the strongest of which was Hodapata a, a fortress that was perched on a rock outcrop about 102 miles north of Jerusalem. When you consider the arrogance of many of the Jewish leaders, as we've already mentioned, and their their determination uh, to war with Rome, And then you couple that with arrogance of some of the Roman rulers like Caligula who considered himself to be a god and demanded to be worshipped by all under his rule. In 40 AD, He decreed that a statue representing him as a god that was erected in the temple at Jerusalem, that all Jews were to worship and sacrifice to his statue. An immediate Jewish uprising was averted only by the timely assassination of Caligula by members of his own Praetorian Guard in 41 AD. Nevertheless, the relations between the Jews and the Roman rule very quickly deteriorated. In 66 AD, the strained uh, relations between the two could not withstand the brutal rule of Procurator Gessius Florus. He, unfortunately, as an enemy of the Jews, was also determined to bring about war with the Jews. And because of that determination, he raided the temple treasury. He allowed uh, anti-Semitic riots to be uh, proceed unchecked in Caesarea. He himself had hundreds of Jews crucified in Jerusalem 
simply because they displayed, at least in his mind, insolence toward him. When the populace of Jerusalem finally rose in revolt against him, he fled the city while the Roman garrison succumbed to the armed mobs of the Jews. In November 66 AD, Cestius Gallus, who was the governor of Syria, tried to restore order, but the bulk of his army was destroyed by these uh, Jewish rebels. When this happened, Nero, who was at the time the emperor, chose Vespasian to subdue Judea. In late April 67 AD, Vespasian's army, a force totaling almost 60,000 fighting men, was ready for battle. He advanced on Gabara, burning all the villages and hamlets in his path and putting to death anyone in his way. He found the city lightly defended and he overwhelmed it with his very first assault. As a warning against resistance, he had all of its inhabitants slaughtered, sparing only the children who were sold into slavery. He then turned toward Hodapada, the strongest fortress in Galilee, where Josephus was. He was leading at that time then, leading the Jewish rebellion. It took the Romans 40 days of fierce fighting to take Hodapada. They took heavy casualties to the Roman forces. The Jews under the leadership of Josephus. Uh, many of them uh, were very brave in the fighting. But uh, many of their tactics, um, they would deceive the Roman soldiers. For example, they would uh, pretend to surrender. And when they could pull some of the Roman forces away from um, the others, then they would surround them uh, and they would kill them all. That was just one of the methods that they had uh, in fighting uh, the, Roman, the Roman soldiers. But because of the heavy casualties to the Roman forces, the Romans showed no pity on the town of Hodapada. According to Josephus, the total Jewish slain in Hodapada exceeded 40,000. The only survivors were 1,200 prisoners that were taken by Vespasian to be sold into slavery. Near the end of the battle, Josephus uh, having been the leader of the, uh, of the Jewish uh, army, the Jewish rebels. He saw that the zealots were determined that they would not surrender. In fact, um, anyone who tried to surrender were killed by the zealots. And so... Realizing their determination, he had the idea uh, and he proposed that he would slip out of the city, uh, past the Roman armies, and that he would then uh, go to the other towns, other cities in the area and try to um, uh, get some of the other Jewish forces, some of the other Jewish rebels to come to the aid and to the defense of the city of Hodapada. Now, uh, the zealots did not trust Josephus and felt, uh, in fact, they accused him of treason. 
And when they had determined to assign a guard to Josephus, then he promptly dropped his proposal to leave the city. As the city was being taken by the Romans, Josephus hid in a, a cavern that, was, uh, that opened up into the side of a very deep pit um, that actually was not visible from above. But when he found, uh, when he hid there, there were uh, some 40 others with him uh, in that cavern. Uh, some of the zealots. And they had determined that they would not be taken alive. And Josephus, knowing that, proposed that, that they would cast lots and that uh, each of them in casting lots, it would be determined which one of them would kill the other right on down the line until the last man was left, and then he would then take his own life. And some say by chance, others not so much. Josephus was the last man. Actually, there were two men left. And uh, with, uh, with the two men that were left, Josephus then convinced the other that it would be best for them to, uh, to surrender to the Romans. Josephus, Josephus was taken in chains to Vespasian. Vespasian ordered him to be sent immediately to Rome for Nero to judge personally, which likely would have uh, meant his execution. But Josephus asked for a private word with uh, both uh, Vespasian and also Titus, uh, who was uh, Vespasian's son. And when he was brought to Vespasian, he asked Vespasian why he would send him to Nero and then he predicted to Vespasian that he himself would become emperor. At first, Vespasian doubted Josephus' words, thinking him a liar who was merely, merely trying to save his own neck. But he kept, uh, instead of sending him to Rome, he kept him in chains as a prisoner in Titus' army. Then, less than one year later, in uh, June of 68 A.D., Nero was dead, and a year of bloody civil war began that saw three consecutive Roman emperors rise and fall in rap rapid succession. Uh, the first was murdered. The second was then uh, 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 captured and committed suicide. And then the third also was murdered, three in one year period. Then the conflict ended with uh, Vespasian's own soldiers and those under his command, uh, in fact, demanding that he become the emperor. Not just suggesting it, but even to the point of drawing their swords to force him to accept the being emperor, according to Josephus. And there were also other generals uh, in, the, in the Roman armies that also uh, supported Vespasian's uh, becoming, becoming the emperor. When he became, when he was proclaimed Caesar in July of 69 AD in Judea, he returned to Rome and became uh, the ruler of the world then. He immediately, remembering Josephus' prediction, Josephus considered it a prophecy, but remembering that uh, prediction, Vespasian then immediately uh, sent and had Josephus 
read. And he appointed him consultor and negotiator for his son Titus, who then became the leader of the Roman army for the remainder of the Jewish war. And we might mention the fact that after the war, uh, Josephus returned, actually returned to Rome with Titus. And Emperor Vespasian gave him uh, a home, one of his own homes when he was a private citizen, gave him a full pension and also Roman citizenship. And it was while living in luxury at the Caesar's court that Josephus adopted the Latin name of Flavius Josephus, or I should say Joseph ben Matthias, adopted the name Flavius Josephus. And then he began writing uh, the histories of the Jewish revolt. And it is primarily through Joseph, uh, Josephus rather, that today we know uh, many of the details of uh, the assaults on Hodapata, uh, the siege of Jerusalem, as well as the last stand of the Jews at Masada in 73 AD. In 70 AD, Vespasian rode with his cavalry up to the walls of Jerusalem. Having, uh, as we've already seen, conquered uh, Hodapata. And as he comes to uh, the borders of Jerusalem, this was the time when, as we've already mentioned, there began to be uh, basically a civil war uh, among Rome in the sense that uh, you had the three different uh, men that became emperors over a one-year period and were all killed. But it was actually while then that he had come to Jerusalem it was then that he was declared as the emperor. And so he returned back to Rome then. And he sent his own son Titus then to Jerusalem in order to crush the revolt. While this was taking place, as we've already mentioned, there was... Uh, many factions among the Jews, and there was a lot of strife even among them. And they were fighting each other and killing one another, even as Rome prepared to march on Jerusalem. Fighting between the zealots who were led by Eliezer, the followers of John of Jeshachal, uh, and the followers of Simon of Jorah, as we said, uh, Josephus records how that uh, even as many worshipers came to worship there in Jerusalem, that they in fact would even be killed by some of these factions. Some of these, uh, we might refer to them as rebel groups there uh, among the Jews. Josephus made this statement. He said, for despite war, the sacrifices went on. And those who had journeyed from all over the world to worship there sprinkled the altar with their own blood. And that because of the fighting of the factions. During this time, the three warring camps, as they were fighting with one another, also burned each other's food supplies. Great stores of grain, which would have supplied the Jews for years while besieged by the Romans, were destroyed by the factions themselves. Jerusalem eventually fell to self-imposed famine as a result. The Jewish people, as they were terrorized by these three factions, actually prayed that the Romans might come and deliver them from that internal strife. So you can imagine then the 
the environment there in the city of Jerusalem. And you can, you can try to imagine being just a common citizen there in that city during this time period. These three factions, though, disagreeing on practically everything else. But they were united on one thing. They were united in the fact that no one would surrender to Rome. That in fact any of the common people who desired to surrender to Rome, desired peace, they themselves would be put to death by the Jewish leadership. So, there was no other hope of escape for the Jewish common people. After Vespasian sent Titus, and Titus brought his armies to the city of Jerusalem, he formed his camp for the armies within full view of the residents of Jerusalem in efforts to intimidate them. There were at the time 23,400 Jewish combatants and rebels within the city. But Josephus says that it was strife among those factions that ultimately subdued the city. He says, which suffered nothing worse from the Romans than what the partisans inflicted upon one another. As Titus came to Jerusalem, there were three walls that fortified the city of Jerusalem, except where impassable ravines bordered it. The inner wall, erected by David, Solomon, and their successors, boasted 60 towers. The middle wall, 14 towers. And the outer wall, erected by King Agrippa to enclose the northern additions to the city, had 90 towers. The circumference of the city at this time was about four miles. Titus leveled the ground to the city walls, removing uh, everything in his way in order to bring up the battering rams, in, in order to uh, break through the walls to the city. Opposite the northern and western walls, Titus arranged his forces seven ranks deep. Three of infantry in front and of cavalry to the rear with a line of archers in the middle. The Roman soldiers destroyed the suburbs and they erected earthworks uh, next to the walls to be able to bring the battering rams up to the wall so that they could uh, um, be able to enter. Siege towers were also built by the Romans and they were plated with iron so that they couldn't be set afire by the Jews. And there were archers and also stone throwers that were, were set up in those towers uh, where many of the Jews were killed uh, because they were not able to reach them with their weaponry. With each of the three walls, uh, the Romans would build those earthworks and bring up the battering rams. By the end of the conflict, they had leveled every tree within 12 miles of the city of Jerusalem. Titus did everything within his power to persuade the Jews to surrender. Josephus was used, and Josephus would um, ride around the walls of the city of Jerusalem, uh, calling out to his own people, calling out to the Jews for them to surrender so that the city would not be destroyed, so that the temple would not be destroyed. Titus promised to give freedom to those who would surrender. 
But because of famine that we already mentioned, that they brought upon themselves those factions uh, fighting against one another, some 500 Jews were being captured daily as they tried to find food for their families. Many of those that were captured were crucified by the Romans uh, before, uh, before the wall so that those inside would be encouraged to surrender. Titus' goal was to preserve the city and the temple. He promised to restore property to those who would surrender. Many of the Jews wished to surrender. But recall that the leadership within the city would not allow it. Those who were caught trying to surrender were put to death. Nevertheless, many of them did surrender. They, they would uh, escape the city. Uh, many, as we said, were caught and were put to death uh, by those factions, but some of them did surrender, and Titus uh, released most of them to encourage more to surrender. But Josephus records that some of the wealthy among the Jews in their surrender would swallow some of their gold coins and then surrender to the Romans. And then Titus would release them. And then, as the gold coins were passed then through their digestive system, then they had been freed, and so they had their gold coins. But some of the Arab and Syrian allies to the Romans when they discovered this, they began to intercept those Jews who were trying to surrender, and they killed them. And they searched their intestines for those gold coins. Many of the Jews were killed in that way. In fact, Josephus records that there were 2,000 killed in this manner in one night. 2,000 in one night. And when Titus learned of this, he threatened to execute all of these soldiers, but, but they were allies to the Romans. And so he didn't do so, but he did warn that if it continued to happen, they would be executed. But that didn't stop them. Josephus records that they then continued it, but they would do so in hiding. And so many of the Jews lost their lives. And of course, he mentioned the fact that, you know, there were not that many uh, gold coins that were found. Nevertheless, because some were found, that many of them lost their lives uh, in that way. Titus, at Titus' orders, uh, because the conflict was taking too long, at Titus' orders, the Roman soldiers built a wall around the city of Jerusalem in three days, a wall five miles long. That would keep anyone from coming in and keep anyone from coming out. This left the Jews to either surrender or starve to death. Now remember, there, were already, there was already a famine because of the factions destroying their food supplies. Now, Titus had surrounded the city, not allowing anyone to leave and not allowing anyone to enter. Thousands upon thousands of Jews were devoured by famine within the city. There were so many deaths by starvation, and Josephus records that uh, that many of them, because of weakness themselves, could not even bury the dead. And so they began tossing the dead out into the ravines. It's recorded that over 600,000 bodies of those among the lower uh, classes were tossed out into those ravines. Some 116,000 just in an 11-week period. 
who died because of starvation. Parents, driven mad by hunger, kept available food for themselves while their own children died. Josephus told of a wealthy woman named Mary who took her own infant son who she was still breastfeeding. She killed him. She roasted him. She ate part of him and hid the other. And he records that uh, some, uh, some among the Jewish rebels, when they learned of, in fact, he records that they could, they smelled the cooking of the child. But they thought that she was hiding food from them. And they came and they learned what she had done. And it is said that when even Titus learned of this, that he declared before his God that this was the fault of the Jews themselves because he wanted no part, no responsibility in this. When the Romans finally uh, breached the walls and came to uh, the temple area, the courtyard, Titus was determined not, being a religious man himself and fearing the gods, he was determined that it not be destroyed. But Josephus records that basically Titus, because of the fury of the Roman soldiers and, uh, and the amount of casualties they had lost and in the ways that the Jews had uh, you know, tricked many of their comrades and, and had killed them, that basically Titus lost control of them. And so uh, they, in fact, destroyed the temple. They uh, set it afire after plundering it, which actually uh, many of the the factions themselves had already uh, taken many of the things from from the temple. Uh, But the Roman soldiers massacred everyone they found, burning the houses, with any who had taken shelter in them. Josephus says, So great was the slaughter that in many places the flames were put out by streams of blood. 1,100,000 Jews died in the siege of Jerusalem. 97,000 more were taken prisoner. Those that were under the age of 17 were sold into slavery. And then many of the prisoners that were taken were either sold to the mines in Egypt or presented the provinces to be killed by sword or by beast in the theaters. Now we may ask ourselves, you know, what does that history really have to do with us? When we realize the fact that the Jews as God's people were a foreshadowing of the people of God today, Christians, citizens of Christ's kingdom. And we see in Matthew chapter 23 the warning of Jesus himself to the Jews before before all of these atrocities took place. In Matthew 23, he says, beginning of verse 34, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify. Some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
Thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. They could have, if they had surrendered themselves to God. But you know, this is true even as we go back and we study the prophets. It was mentioned earlier today, the book of Judges. Over and over, the people of God. God giving them every opportunity. And yet over and over they rebel and over and over be destroyed. And yet we today, as the Lord's people, as the church, you know, we think about, and of course, uh, you know, history records here in Matthew 24, uh, Jesus uh, concerning the temple, and He said, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Chapter 24 and verse 2. Josephus doesn't mention Christians. He does mention the fact that uh, before Titus came, there were were some that escaped the city of Jerusalem. But another historian, Eusebius, wrote of the Jewish Christians being warned by revelation from God to depart Jerusalem and to dwell in Pella, city of Perea. And he says, To it, that is Pella, those who believed on Christ migrated from Jerusalem, that when holy men had altogether deserted the royal capital of the Jews and the whole land of Judea, the judgment of God might at last overtake them for all their crimes against the Christ and His apostles." And all that generation of the wicked be utterly blotted out from among men. You know, as we think about ourselves, uh, these departures and these things that are taking place, and we need to understand that as God's people, our trust needs to be in Him. And no matter what, we do not leave God, we do not leave His will, but we keep our faith in Him and in His Word always. And even though persecutions may come, it's nothing compared to the destruction that is the result of rebelling against the will of God. Perhaps there's one here this evening who's not a child of God. There's nothing greater than we can be than a child of God, a Christian. And we encourage you this evening, if you have faith in God, that that faith will lead you to penitence. That that faith will lead you to confess the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and your Savior. Be baptized into Christ that His blood may cleanse your sins, that we may then live as Christians, that we may live as citizens of the greatest kingdom that has ever been. Perhaps there's one as a child of God who for whatever reason has rebelled against God, has rebelled against His will. We encourage you to repent. Over and over the prophets of God in the Old Testament encouraged them to repent. And even as we read in the New Testament, Jesus and His apostles encouraging them to repent. So many would not. We encourage you, if you need to respond in any way to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to do so while we stand and while we sing. Holy words of